Well, this is the CBF Podcast Conversation. Each week, we're bringing you stories from across the world of people doing groundbreaking and innovative work in renewing God's world. Ideas, stories, and creativity from practitioners, ministers, thinkers, authors, and more. I'm Andy Hale, CBF's podcast host. And this week, we have a special Facebook and YouTube live interview about welcoming the stranger, a conversation on advocacy for immigration and refugees. Just a few moments, I'll introduce our guest and we'll jump into our conversation. But I do want to let you know that if you're watching this now uh, live, you have the opportunity to send some questions to our guest. Uh, you can simply comment on this video feed with your question. Uh, we also need to tell you about one of our annual sponsors, uh, McAfee School of Theology. Uh, McAfee School of Theology at Mercer University, who exists to train ministers who inspire the church and the world to imagine, discover, and create God's future. Located in Atlanta, Georgia, the McAfee School of Theology offers doctoral and master level degree programs, including a fully online Master of Divinity degree, the only fully online MDiv offered by a nationally researched university. You can visit their website, theology.mercer.edu, to learn more about their programs and scholarships. Well, our guest for this week's special live conversation is Reverend Dr. Sharon Stanley Ray, Matthew Sorens, and Elkett Rodriguez. Thank you all for joining the conversation, and, and might I say, and may the fourth be with you. <laughs> well, no liturgical response back, and also with you. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, well, each of you uh, are in this conversation because you bring a, a unique perspective and experience to the conversation. So let's get to know you and your work a little bit better. Um, Sharon, we'll begin with you. Uh, you serve as the Director of Refugees and Immigration Ministries for the Disciples Home Missions, uh, part of the Disciples of Christ denomination. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what you do. Yes, thank you, Andy, and hello to all of you who are joining in today. It's such a joy to be a part of your team and to work with your colleague from CBF Elkhead on an ongoing basis through our partnership with Interfaith Partners. I am a Disciples of Christ clergy, originally ordained as Presbyterian clergy, who has worked for the last 30 plus years with refugee communities and immigrant communities, initially as one who uh, lived in refugee neighborhoods for many, many years in the Central Valley of California, and also started and directed for almost two decades an organization there before moving to Washington, D.C. about eight years ago. Now I work as our national director for Disciples of Christ denomination, working in all arenas of refugee and immigration policy and also maybe most important in the work, congregational engagement, helping to nurture and to build relationships and partnerships in each community. Great. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Matthew, you are the U.S. Director of Church Mobilization for World Relief. Uh, what does that work look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so World Relief is the, uh, it's a global Christian ministry. We work in various countries around the world. In the U.S., we're probably best known for refugee resettlement. We're one of nine agencies nationally that works with the U.S. State Department to resettle refugees. Uh, but one thing that's, you know, important about World Relief is our mission isn't just to resettle refugees well or integrate immigrants into communities, but to empower the local church to serve the most vulnerable. So my job at World Relief is basically to make sure we stick to that mission, uh, because if we do a superb job of resettling refugees in the community and the local churches in the community don't know that we're there or weren't a part of that process, then we have missed out on at least half of our mission. So that's that's my role, role with World Relief. And a lot of that also ends up addressing issues of, of policy and advocacy as well and how we can engage churches in addressing policy issues that affect refugees and other immigrants. Well, no, Kat, you, you've been serving as CBF and CBF Southwest Immigration and Refugee uh, Advocacy Mission Specialist for a little over a year. In fact, you and I began uh, you, you began your work right when the pandemic was starting. Um, we were uh, in the U.S. Capitol together when everything began to shut down. So um, uh, tell us a little bit more about what your work with CBF looks like. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for this opportunity. And I remember those days when they were the, the normal days when you when COVID was not around. Uh, so I represent the CBF and Fellowship Southwest uh, with our national and regional immigration advocacy partners. Uh, and whenever we need to have congress a congressional meeting or to be present at a meeting with the White House on immigration related issues, I advise pastors, uh, assist and represent immigrants and refugees and partner with churches and other organizations to bring about policy changes that 
uh, ultimately seek justice for immigrants and, reg and refugees. Uh, I also write stories and host conferences to raise awareness around um, the plight of immigrants and refugees. I also assist border pastors uh, who serve migrants in Northern Mexico, uh, those pastors that comprise Fellowship Southwest's uh, Immigrant Relief Ministry with the purpose of impro improving their mission work. And so that's exactly what, uh, what I do uh, on a daily basis. And that's where I got to meet uh, Matthew Sorensen and, Sharon Stan and Reverend Sharon Stanley Ray. Right. Now, uh, calling is such a, a powerful story to share. So I wonder if each of you would share your sense of calling to working alongside immigrants and refugees. Matthew, we'll start with you. Yeah, you know, I think my work in this area probably got started. I mean, I, I might have a few different origin stories, but I was a, a college senior in a class at Wheaton College outside of Chicago. And a classmate made an announcement that she had been volunteering with World Relief down the street from our campus with a refugee family from Rwanda and had really connected well to this family. It was almost become like, like she had been embraced as a part of their family. But this particular family had several daughters and then one son who I think was about 12 at the time. And she shared that she just connected so well to this family and to these girls, but she felt like the boy in particular would benefit from a male mentor who would maybe just go play basketball with him once a week. And as a college senior, I thought, you know, I sometimes behave like a 12 year old. I could be really good at this. So I, you know, went and talked to her afterwards and got connected to that family. And um, they just became really dear friends and in many ways became my mentors in understanding the refugee experience. And um, with my gateway to I, when I finished college, I actually moved into their apartment complex. So I had neighbors from about 20 different countries of origin, many of whom had come through the res refugee resettlement process, others of whom were immigrants of other varieties some with legal status, some without. So I began wrestling with all those questions of some of the policy dynamics that come into play as well. And how do I think about those things as a Christian? And around the same time, I started my work with World Relief. So I've been at World Relief for about 15 years now. And for the last 10 or so, I, I started in a role providing legal services, um, but now for about a decade, really mostly working with local churches and trying to help churches that are sometimes wrestling with the tension of how do we respond to these biblical commands to love and welcome people while also honoring the law, while also, you know, engaging some of the complexities that come up in our society right now as immigration and refugees have become a, a fairly controversial issue. Hmm. Elkett, uh, share a little bit about your story. So actually I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. I was an attorney uh, in Puerto Rico. And after Hurricane Maria uh, in 2017, uh, pretty much uh, destroyed a, a whole part of the island. Uh, I was. I, I asked God what I should do, and um, <laughs> it's gonna be sound funny, but I remember praying to God and telling Him what's gonna be my next step. And when I got back to my apartment, uh, my landlord, who is a pastor, told me, "Elkid, you were praying to God, and you told Him this, 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 and this." And I was like, "What?" So she actually told me my, everything that I prayed for, and she said, "You're gonna go to Texas." and you're going to do mission work there. And I was like, really? Well, if he wants me in Texas, he's going to have to provide something for me to be in Texas. And lo and behold, a week after I had a job in Texas, uh, I began working uh, in Texas and, and I ended up working at, in the First Baptist Church in Midland, Texas as the family ministry assistant. And while I was there, I began, um, I started watching a lot of immigrants show up at church. And I was probably one of the only persons who spoke Spanish that could relate with them. And, and that's where it all began. And I started uh, uh, helping them as an attorney with some uh, immigration work and paperwork and applications. And just to quote, cut, the short, cut the story short, uh, once I went to Matamoros and saw what was happening, with the migrants who were living in the Matamoros camp under uh, on, under tens, thousands of migrants and asylum seekers just waiting there uh, for their opportunity to come to the United States. It really hit me and, and, and God started working on me and, and lo and behold, uh, I ended up working as with CBF and Fellowship Southwest as the immigrant and refugee uh, advocacy and mission specialist. So God kind of drove uh, drove me through to this, and and, and really it, it it captivated me 
uh, my heart. And I, and I looked at myself and my skill set and what a God uh, had placed in me. And I said, I, I think I can fit here. and I can do something for the kingdom. Mm. Sharon. I love the question. I appreciate you asking it. And I also love hearing the responses from my colleagues. But I think the question opens up why it is any of us are connected now still with refugees and immigrants, because it always goes back to God's thread of relationship building. And for me, I think the the first inspiration to want to connect with persons of immigrant and refugee backgrounds, which are different from my own individual background, started in the very early and mid 60s. I was living in South Carolina and it started because of the resistance to the other that was very much dominant in the location where I lived. My father was a pastor as well, and he was criticized because the leaders of the church were frustrated that he would not agree with them that blacks should not be allowed to come. Uh, they thought blacks should not be allowed to come to church. And my father was saying, no, all should be welcome. So from those initial points of, of confusion, really, and, and thinking, how is it that we can be in the same country, be neighbors, and yet not care and love and accept one another um, in my life that emerged into at a time when I was in elementary school, and maybe some who are watching today have similar memories of having seen day by day uh, those who are becoming refugees in the Vietnam War, who then were starting to come to the U.S. And our congregation reached out to a family. It had a great impact on me. And then it was really many years later and after living in South Korea and then going to seminary that, you you know, God pulled a typical God trick and sense of humor <laughs> on me by having my first ministry call be what was supposed to be a three month temporary assignment working with refugee communities in California and throughout the Central Valley, because I thought it was going to be such a short time. I moved directly into a huge refugee neighborhood and then ended up living there almost 20 years. And it, and the ministry really grew and emerged and took form after that point. So it was God wooing and pulling um, as if by a string, point by point throughout life. And then and then seeing so many, as Matthew spoke, you know, individuals who had legal status, who didn't have legal status, seeing them regardless of their backgrounds, you know, hit walls and then coming to understand Policy is what plays a key role in helping to open up opportunities for individual and family lives. And so that's then uh, how I moved into this next point of work. You know, for many listening to this, there's an assumed theological understanding of the connection between working for the rights and equal treatment of immigrants and refugees. But for some, this might be a starting place for this theological connection. Uh, so let's let's start right there. I wonder if you might hearken back to when you realized that the care for immigrants and refugees was directly connected to the Christian faith tradition that you're a part of. Um, Sharon, we'll start with you. I can say I began to have that realization in a very uncomfortable way. As I was growing up, going to church every Sunday, but literally could look around in my congregation in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia and see that pretty much everyone in every pew looked like me. And yet when I looked into the Bible that was in the pews and that was being spoken about, I saw Jesus very intentionally connecting with those who were different from himself, inviting us to sit at table with ones from many backgrounds and the Old Testament prophets speaking about the need for us to open up and offer jubilee and freedom to those who have been bound and have been oppressed. So it was that disconnect for me between how my own congregation looked that 
pushed me to realize church is never just about pews. Church is maybe especially about the outreach that that looks and sees as God saw Hagar in the wilderness and recognized her need for justice. Matthew. Yeah, you know, I think I probably had a similar uh, path as, as as Sharon did. I, you know, I grew up in a great church, a Bible church, where you know I memorized a lot of Bible verses as a kid and heard a lot of sermons and was in a lot of small group discussions. And yet, somehow, as I started engaging immigration issues, um, you know, as a volunteer, and then even as my job. I didn't have really any idea what the Bible said on this topic because those were not the Bible verses we memorized or the ser topics of the sermons that I'd heard. And I, I really began wrestling as I was wondering, almost on a personal level, you know, I know I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself. I've got my faith down at least at that level. These are clearly my neighbors, in my case, quite literally, though um, it's pretty clear from Luke 10 that Jesus didn't mean that as only the people who live next to you. But I was also wrestling with, well, some of them may not be here legally, and we're supposed to be subject to governing authorities. That's in the Bible, too. And so what do I think about this? And does the Bible have anything to say that might inform how we would think about issues of immigration? And I really started, you know, looking into this and just rereading my Bible with some new lens. And honestly, I felt a little bit dumb because I realized that the Bible talks about immigration a lot. Uh, well, you know, a basic word search will tell you that the Hebrew word for an immigrant, or depending upon your translation of the Bible into English, it's sojourner, stranger, alien, um, foreigner. That word in in is in the Hebrew is ger, and it appears 92 times in the Old Testament. It's a really frequent theme. Uh, often we find the the immigrant alongside the orphan and the widow uh, in the same passages as groups of people whom God makes very clear that He loves and whom He will care for. That's Psalm 146. It's in Deuteronomy 10. But then whom he also very explicitly commands his people to love and to protect and care for and to seek justice for as well. Uh, and, and then going into the New Testament, even to recognize, um, well, the New Testament and the Old, how many of the heroes and heroines of our faith were themselves crossing borders at one point in their story. So most importantly, Jesus himself, who fled as a small child uh, across the border into Egypt, fleeing a genocide under a paranoid paranoid, tyrannical Middle Eastern king, um, but really throughout the Old Testament as well, from whether it's Abraham or Moses, Moses' identity as an immigrant was so important to him, his, his, he named one of his children um, Gershom, which basically means an alien there. Like that was the name that he gave his son. It was so central to his identity. So as I really do dove back into the scriptures, the Bible has a lot to say on this. And that, I'm always really careful. It doesn't tell you specifically how many refugees should come to the United States in a given year or, you know, all the details of, of policy questions, but it's can inform how we think about those policy issues on a principal level. And certainly it has a lot to say actually quite specifically about how to treat our immigrant neighbors. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I come from this, from another perspective, I'm used to going to church and seeing people who's different than me. Uh, I'm in Puerto Rico, I see um, people who look African-American in, in the States. I mean, uh, uh, people who look Asian, people who look white. I mean, there's a whole, the whole palette <laughs> is in my country. And whenever I went to church, I mean, there was not a conversation about, uh, about that at all. I mean, you were either a Christian, you're coming to church, you need something, we're here. And so when I come to the States, and I saw that churches were divided among among colors, if you want to say, it really struck me uh, and made me realize um, where is this difference in the Bible? And and to be honest, it's I, I haven't been able to find it. <laughs> um, if I look at Apocalypse, I mean at, at Revelations, in Apocalypse it's in Spanish, but in, at Revelations, uh, and I see uh, uh, people from every nation and and from every uh, uh, background on in the world uh they will say that jesus christ is, is the lord so i mean it's over it's there in the bible and so that's what what really has framed my thinking that uh this uh this faith that we talk about our faith in jesus uh, does not have any racial or or, or um or uh, national boundary in a sense um uh, also in hebrews 13 2 uh, we are required to show hospitality to strangers and and the story of the good samaritan samaritan compels us to be merciful to the stranger therefore we are christians are called to love welcome and see jesus 
in the foreigner in the foreigner and their struggle but there's if there's one verse that really has uh, changed my view of immigrants is matthew 25 31 to 46. um so jesus highlights the stranger among quote the least of these unquote he goes as far as to say that whatever we do to the least of these we are going to do to him in that sense jesus is commanding us to welcome the stranger because we not only should see him in the stranger but in that same verse uh bible uh, past uh verse you're going to look that he equates uh, the migrants with widows and orphans as matthew was saying and so and, and what really struck me is the fact that in matthew 25 the main theme it's judgment it's the judgment of the nations where god is going to divide the goats from the sheep and so we how we treat migrants and how we treat uh, those who are oppressed have eternal implications in our lives and and how and it shows how much we love jesus and so that's what really has changed my whole view on immigration well, you all have alluded to it, um, and we don't have to go through the countless calls from Scripture to care for the stranger, the alien, the foreigner, the immigrant, and the refugee among us. Uh, from the Mosaic Law to the lips of the prophets to the ministry of Jesus, the Bible affirms strongly and clearly the obligation to treat strangers with dignity and hospitality. So how do American Christians, uh, and more or less evangelicals, claim to have a high value of Scripture and often have the inability to connect theologically between their view of immigration refugees to their treatment of immigrants and refugees through political allegiance and worldviews. Sharon, you want to take a stab at that one first? Yeah, I'll take a stab at it and in no way to be uh, critical, but really to say that for me, I continue to be mutually inspired by a couple of ways that uh, scripture calls. First of all, scripture calls me as one who happens to be white from uh, a community that has been deeply and consistently privileged in this country. It calls me to exemplify a completely um, often countercultural set of values to be compassionate, to be uh, to repent of what I do wrong and to confess, to uh, recognize the the lack of wisdom that I often may have. And at the same time, the Bible shows me through character after character after character, how I am to be acting differently. We think of Abraham and Sarah in the desert, you know, when they welcomed the strangers who were referred to also as angels in that passage in Genesis, when they welcomed them, they used over 30 quarts of flour to prepare uh, goods for them. They were, that was completely over, far over and above was the level of their hospitality. But I also likewise think of stories of ones who are immigrants themselves in scripture, the family of Moses that through their own ingenuity made a plan for how their son could avoid death. And even to the point where Moses' mother was able to work in Pharaoh's um, premises and make money to feed the rest of the family. I think of the persistence of the widow. And we've talked about widows being mentioned so often, but they were vulnerable in the community and often also were uh, not of a dominant uh, cultural background in the community. And yet, they were rewarded. They were often looked to as ones who were thought to be among the most faithful. So I am impressed uh, and I am motivated by those kind of images in scripture. Elkett, uh, talk to us about the disconnect between uh, evangelicals' high view of scripture, which obviously shows the call for care for immigrants and oftentimes our political allegiance and support that does not see favorably to the treatment of immigrants and refugees um i i really believe that um 
uh, I think it's more a kind of educational. You need to, it's more an issue of education about how we uh, have been teaching the Bible uh, for a long time and from the, the worldview of the person who's teaching. Um, and I think that um, from that perspective, uh, people like Matthew, like Sharon, uh, like me, like you, and this type of conversations are really important to let people know, you know what? Um, the Bible speaks about immigrants and how we treat them. The Bible speaks about immigration policies. When you go back to Leviticus, when you go back to um, uh, Exodus, you're going to see God stressing out, uh, being very interested in immigration laws back then, if you want to put it that way. Several times, uh, he, the Bible tells the people of Israel, and to re were re the people of Israel were reminded that to treat foreigners as equals to the natives. So in a sense is more than a political affiliation. It's more of, you know what? The Bible has something to say about this. And, and let that frame your, your political views because your political views cannot go over the Bible. You can have them as long as they're not um, uh, count, they don't go counter to what the Bible is saying. So in that sense, I, I do believe that this work we're doing, uh, it's very important to try and, and change the mindset of, of, of not just the, poli the political thinking, but at least the approach we have on immigrants and, and let that sink in into our minds so we can, um, so that people can change their minds and have Jesus's heart heart for immigrants and migrants. Matthew? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I'd certainly agree with that. Um, you know, I think on one level, evangelicals, U.S. evangelicals' views on immigrants are, are actually more nuanced than I think sometimes people realize. I mean, there are polls that show um, uh, on one level, white evangelicals have some of the most hostile views towards immigrants of any religious demographic, but there are also polls that find that most white evangelicals would support something like uh, an earned legalization process for undocumented immigrants. So they're not always lining up in exactly the ways we think we would. But to the extent that there is hostility that seems out of line with the scriptures, and I, I certainly have observed that and encountered that occasionally, I think that it goes to that lack of discipleship, frankly. Uh, you know, we, we actually were looking at this question at World Relief with some of our partners at the Evangelical Immigration Table a few years back, really trying to figure out, because we're focused as an organization on empowering churches to serve refugees and other immigrants, you know, what was the disconnect? And we asked self-described evangelical Christians in the United States, and this was a LifeWay research survey that they conducted for us, what was the top influence on their views on issues of immigration? And, you know, they told us in advance, when you ask people, evangelicals in particular, a question, and the Bible is one of the choices, a bunch of people are going to select the Bible because it's the right answer, regardless of if it's the true answer. But it's like, they, you know, they know that that's the right answer. And yet, actually, most evangelicals didn't make that selection. The Bible was selected by 12% of evangelical Christians as the top influence on their views on immigration. The Bible and my local church and the views of national Christian leaders combined came up less often than media. And I, I think that speaks to the challenge. I mean, I've, I've had pastors tell me, you know, I know this is a biblical issue, but my people have me at most one Sunday a week, and they've got certain cable news channels and personalities and talk radio and Facebook and Twitter, giving them different messages seven days a week. And uh, to their credit, I've seen lots of pastors figure out how do we ground ourselves in the Bible in a way that, not to say it'll make everyone happy, but we can address this issue in a way that isn't partisan. It's not Republicans or Democrats, but is rooted in the scriptures. And, um, you know, I think a lot of church, more churches have been doing that. We've been trying to help create resources to help churches look at this as a discipleship issue um, and come at the policy questions, which are important, but secondarily to the, to the biblical questions. Uh, but there's still clearly a lot of work to do there. Yeah. I mean, uh, challenge nowadays you know people are going to i agree with you people are going to say the bible in their local church but you know where are they giving most of their time during the week well you know cable news and uh depending on what cable news you subscribe to uh shapes your worldview and how you might view immigrants and refugees uh, and certainly if you're looking to national evangelical leaders i mean even franklin graham was quoted this week uh, in response to the biden administration's uh, release yesterday which we can get to in just a moment that he said, quote, the Bible doesn't talk about immigration. Uh, so 
Uh, there's a lot to unpack there, uh, and we'll get to uh, shortly. But uh, we remind folks listening to this or watching this, you can add your questions for our guest, and we hope to get to it later on. Uh, we need to pause to tell you about one of our other annual sponsors, the Center for Congregational Health, whose mission is to help faith communities and their leaders thrive. Healthy congregations can transform their communities to be more compassionate, faithful, and just. Utilizing a network of highly skilled coaches and consultants and interim ministers, the center supports congregations and ministry leaders to address the challenges they face. Visit their website, healthychurch.org, to learn more about how the center can be your trusted partner in ministry. Immigration and refugees were hot topics during the Trump presidency for obvious reasons. There was the multi-billion dollar wall touted, the closing of the borders, the forced family separation, the uncovering of unfair treatment of asylum seekers, including children being caged. However, recently, uh, immigration reform made news when the Biden White House announced it would continue to limit the number of refugees uh, process for admissions. But after a tremendous public backlash, the administration changed its course. In fact, yesterday, May the 3rd, uh, the Biden administration raised the cap from 15,000 to 60. Uh, uh, 62,000. Uh, and the administration even noted that they would are still trying to hit their first goal of 125,000. Uh, so let's start there. Help us to understand what this decision was all about and how it affects individuals involved in the immigration process. Uh, Matthew, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I think it's important um, for those who don't work directly in the field to understand what a refugee is. A refugee under U.S. law and international law is an individual who has fled their country because of a well-founded fear of persecution on account of their race, religion, political opinion, national origin, or social group. And there are 26 million people who meet that definition globally. It's a higher number than ever before in recorded history. Um, since uh, 1980, in a formal way, when President Carter signed the Refugee Act of 1980, the U.S. has had a refugee resettlement process, whereby the uh, Congress gave to the president the authority on an annual basis to set a ceiling for refugee admissions, that is to say the maximum number who can come in. And that ceiling, um, it was set by President Carter above 231,000 back in 1980, so we have quite a history here. The average ceiling is uh, 95,000 approximately. Uh, president Obama set it at 110,000 his last October 1st or so in office for the, the last partial fiscal year that he was president. And then the first week in office, President Trump lowered that down to 50,000 and then lowered it consecutively every year down to 15,000 last October. And obviously, President Biden campaigned on restoring the refugee resettlement program. He talked about the number of 125,000 during the campaign and reaffirmed that sh shortly after being elected. And then um, you know, we thought that this was all on track when he came into office. Um, a, a few weeks into his administration, there was an executive order that kind of previewed this. A couple of weeks later, the State Department, uh, obviously the Biden State Department, uh, reported to Congress, as they're required to do, that they were intending to raise the refugee ceiling in the middle of the fiscal year on an emergency basis for humanitarian reasons up to 62,500, which would be kind of a prorated 125,000 for halfway through the fiscal year. Um, and then we were excited as a resettlement agency, and we started reaching out to local churches and saying, get ready, there's going to be an increase in number of refugees arriving. And then nothing happened. For weeks, and then literally months, there was just nothing except for vague statements of support from the White House. And then just about two and a half weeks ago, the president signed a new refugee ceiling, and frankly, just shocked us by signing a refugee ceiling at 15,000. I mean, President Joe Biden put his name on the same number that Donald Trump had put his name on last October. And we were very upset by that at World Relief. I know that a lot of our partners at the Evangelical Immigration Table and really a broad range of faith communities really across the spectrum. Um, and, you know, certainly a lot of congressional Democrats were upset, but you also saw some, um, there was a really strong pushback from Republican national security leaders who said this is not what was promised and it's actually not in our national security interests either. And apparently the president heard that pushback because yesterday, as you said, Andy, President Biden signed a new ceiling for 62,500. And with the expressed intention of raising that up to 125,000 for the new fiscal year that'll be on October 1st. So we are th thrilled by that movement by President Biden and thankful for it. We were pretty critical when he <laughs> took the action he did a couple of weeks ago and we'll be grateful when he takes, you know, reverses course. We're big believers in repentance. Uh, although I would say this is a necessary but insufficient step towards rebuilding the refugee resettlement program. There's a lot of other things that the administration needs to do um, in terms of overseas processing, in terms of rebuilding the infrastructure for resettlement in the United States. But signing that ceiling is definitely a critical first step, and, and we're very pleased by it. 
Sharon, what's your take on yesterday's decision? Well, let me say that a couple of weeks ago when we got the previous decision that, as Matthew said, the Biden administration was going to stick with 15,000, we were incredibly disappointed. There were, as he mentioned, statements that came out, I think, from every faith partnership, regardless of the theological bent, um, uh, very progressive faith communities, much uh, more conservative faith communities, everyone as one of our uh, key disciples of Christ leaders, whose name was Governor Ray. He was a five time Republican governor from uh, Iowa for many years who played a role in bringing in thousands and thousands of refugees to middle America. He always said, don't just tell me you care about loving your neighbor, show me. And he taught our whole denomination and then proceeded to influence as he worked for years as the head of the Republican Governor's Convention to help share that welcoming refugees is not and should not be a political issue. It is a humanitarian issue. It is an expression of our faith. So uh, it was it was a wild ride two weeks ago. We are delighted um, together as faith partners to see this change as Christians, we are people of the resurrection. We are people of hope, of new life, of rebuilding, of restoration. And it is enormously exciting, I think, for us all as faith communities to think about what our, our current next steps as well as what our future may hold in terms of restoring and improving a program that has been really decimated, even though it has been one of the most successful public-private partnerships in our history and has been one of the most bipartisan ones as well. Hmm. Elkett, what's your take on yesterday's announcement? Um, I, was, I was very happy uh, to listen to uh, what the president said. I mean, it was a promise he made. Um, so in that sense, uh, uh, we, and as Sharon said, people from from all the faith spectrum came together uh, and and we, we urged the president to follow through with the promise that he made. And, and it made it, it's making me think of what we can do as Christians, and what we can do as faith leaders, in a sense, uh, when we can, you know, be together advocating for a policy that we know it's in line, not just with our values, but that will help uh, persecuted people in the world. And so in that sense, I think that this victory, in a sense, because remember that two weeks ago, we we were all confused, to be honest. Uh, two weeks and a half ago, we were all confused because everything was signaling to that things were going one way and then all of a sudden, sudden they went the other way. But it shows uh, how uh, Christian advocacy pay its dividends. And, and that's why I believe that we should come up together in, on this issue, on the issue of refugees and other issues regarding immigrants because we can change policy and we can make policies reflect our values and and have in mind bear in mind that refugees are already vetted uh, so a lot of people have this confusion between asylum seekers and refugees i just wanted to let everybody know refugees have, are all have are already vetted that we know that they are being persecuted and we know that they need a place where they can seek refuge and there are families and organizations already most of them christian christians waiting to receive them and teach them christian love to them so i re i'm really happy that uh, this is an opportunity for us to continue to share our love uh, around the world uh, you know, when most people hear conversations about immigration reform, typically we only hear about borders, uh, walls, revoking asylum eligibility. What other types of policies do we need to be aware of that are affecting immigrants and refugees? Sharon, we'll start with you. 
Sure. I And I, I want to go back again to the Bible. You know, one of the stories that um, has become very meaningful to me in more recent times has been the story of the daughters of Zelophehad. You know, this group of five daughters in the Old Testament and Numbers chapter 27 doesn't doesn't get read and lifted up much. But if we're talking about policy, it has a really important place because in that we see five daughters who under the law of that time had no inheritance and they took a deeply bold and courageous step to literally walk through their whole community, including many male leaders and tribal leaders in it, to go to the face of Moses and to ask to be given an inheritance. And they did that because they had full confidence that God would want for them also to have a life that is filled with justice and opportunity. And what I think many of us are seeing as we're working uh, in the immigration realm, maybe you know, in some ways, perhaps now more than ever, is many immigrant-led initiatives that are helping those of us who may not be recent immigrants be able to, to stand in partnership and in solidarity. But we're seeing, for example, the lifting up through the voices of DACA recipients themselves of the importance for dreamers to have a way to be protected through legislation. We're seeing that through temporary protected status populations. And we have a number of TPS uh, recipients who have been in the U.S. who have been working for 20 and 30 years who aren't just working in the U.S., right? They are business owners. They are employing more. There are among TPS recipients almost a quarter of a million U.S. citizen children. So we're hearing them say, but, but wait, there must be an opportunity of a pathway to that earned citizenship that Matthew spoke about before. We're hearing the same through farm workers. And I, and I have to say, finally, hearing through farm workers who have been among the hundreds of thousands of essential workers who've literally fed us and helped care for us and uh, other immigrants in health capacities and in our grocery stores throughout the pandemic. Pandemic. So at this point, opportunities for citizenship are very much on the table. We've had conversations in passage of uh, the American Dream and Promise Act on the House side, which would protect both DACA recipients and temporary protected status recipients. We need to get that all the way through um, together with the Farm Workforce Modernization Bill, even as we're likewise working to restore the U.S. refugee system. And I, I want to say, too, really importantly, I think keep lifting up and Elkett's our buddy on the border there, um, close to Matamoros. And asylees, asylum seekers, are ones who have to meet the definition, the same definition for who is a refugee. They have to document that they have been escaping by necessity from persecution, but they do it in a different way and through different processes, either by presenting at the border or by presenting after they have arrived in the U.S. So I think we have a lot of work to do to help our congregations know that, you know, maybe they've been very comfortable with serving as welcome teams for refugees who already have that legal status. But now as our nation is working to restore a decimated asylum system, we also need to, to help train that here are other individuals to welcome them means to do what you've done with refugees and a lot more too uh, in terms of legal assistance because it's very complicated, but we know how to do it. We know we are called to welcome through scripture and this is our challenge in this time. And it's very exciting time, I think, to be church. Hmm. Elkett, policies that we should be aware of? I, I would just echo what uh, Reverend Sharon was saying. Um, in a sense, uh, there's two things I really think we should be uh, watching. The first one is, and, and this is the one that encompasses everything, it's immigration reform. Uh, we need to reform a system that does not respond to anything, 
to be honest. It does not respond to the needs of farm workers. It does not ref respond to the reunification needs of our citizens. It does not respond to the economic needs of our nation. It does not respond to the asylum seeking needs of our neighbors. I mean, it only can respond sometimes to private contractors, to be honest with you, who operate the detention centers. But it does not respond anymore to a lot of the things that we stand as Americans. And when we look at the future, we need to address this in a nation that is right now having the slowest um, birth rate, uh, one of the slowest birth rates ever. And so we need to use this, uh, we need to reform our immigration system to actually, res uh, to, to actually respond to what we want to be in the future. Uh, so right now we have politicians who are not from either side of the aisle, who are not having conversations on what we need right now, less about what we're going to need in the future. And immigration reform is actually that, um, that piece of legislation or, or pieces of legislation together that will allow us to have an immigration system that really not just responds to our Christian values, but as well to our needs as a country. And, and why am I saying this from, why am I talking about immigration reform? Because whenever I talk about the border, immigration reform is in the, it has to do a lot with the border. So I, I look at people uh, making the argument that what's happening at the border, it's separate from, what, from immigration reform, and that's not true. It's actually, we need immigration reform to, reform our asylum system and what's happening at the border. We don't have the infrastructure capacity to address all the mig unaccompanied migrant children that uh, come to our to our borders. Do you know how we can take care of that? Through immigration reform. We don't have enough uh, immigration judges. We have a detention center. We have a lot of detention centers that does not provide humane uh, care to immigrants. Do you know how we address that? Through immigration reform. And so how do we address the root causes of migration? Because we can have a great system in the U.S., but if we don't address those foreign-related issues that, um, that are causing migrants to come to our borders, like climate change, like um, the poverty, like uh, corruption, how do we address that? Through immigration reform. So they're all related, but we need to fight for this. Uh, we need as Christians to let politics, we need as Christian, we need politicians to know that we Christians have a voice and a lot of stake in this and we want to, and we want uh, to see this through. Matthew, other policy we, policies we should be aware of? I mean, I think Alcott was pretty comprehensive there and I would just agree with him. I, I think in some ways the challenges at the border and they're real challenges, um, you you want to call it a crisis or not. It's not a security crisis. It's not a situation where we have all sorts of bad people coming into the country trying to do harm. But it is a humanitarian crisis in that there are more children than our government has the capacity to care for. And the solution to that is, in, in some ways, I would argue it's a legal immigration crisis. People are coming to avail themselves of asylum at the border, which is the only place you can request asylum because they have no legal options to come lawfully to the United States in an orderly manner on an airplane from within their home countries. So if we would expand access to the refugee resettlement program for Central Americans, which this new refugee ceiling could be one step toward doing, if we had more worker visas, when people want to come and fill a labor need in the United States, um, frankly, Mexico and the, the United States created more worker temporary work visas and then permanent worker visas for Mexicans a few years back, and it dramatically reduced illegal immigration from Mexico in particular. Why we haven't done the same for Central America, I cannot comprehend when there are still significant labor needs in the United States, obviously with protections to make sure that, that workers are treated well as also. And then even the, the question of legalization for immigrants who are here already. I mean, what we've advocated for a long time is, is an earned legalization process where people, we're not saying an amnesty that ignores the violation of law. We're saying what's an appropriate penalty 
for having violated immigration law. Like recognizing um, this isn't something that requires malice or harms or harm to someone. It's it's a violation of a law, and we're affirming that the law matters. But most immigrants, in my experience, would be very, very pleased to be able to pay a fine and get right with the law. And that's the sort of proposal that President Obama put forward in 2013, that President Bush put forward in 2006, um, that ultimately could help address the challenge at the border. Because one dynamic people don't realize with these unaccompanied children is that 40% of them have a parent already in the United States. And had those 40% uh, at least been able to legalize their status back when President Bush was pushing this, or even when President Obama was pushing it a little bit less than a decade ago, they would presumably now have green cards and they could file a family petition for those children. They don't qualify to do so when they have uh, no status at all, or maybe they have TPS, temporary protected status for someone from El Salvador um, uh, or Honduras. But um, had we resolved this issue a decade or more ago, we wouldn't have the challenges at the borders now. And to, to Elkett's point, if we want to solve it, not just for the moment, but look to the future, it's important that we address all the pieces that are broken. And something like the Dream Act or the Dream and Promise Act or Farm Workforce Modernization Act are great places to start. But they should be only a place to start because there are a number of elements here that need uh, need Congress's attention. There's so many questions I really wish we had time to get to, but I'm going to be respectful of, of your time and our audience time. Uh, you know, questions around the common experience of those going through the refugee and asylum seeking process. You know, what does that actually look like and what does that feel like? Um, you know, finding accurate and unbiased information on immigration and refugee reform might be tough. News outlets tend to swing right or left. Political parties are the same. So where do you recommend that people go to find accurate information about policies and the experience of those going through this process. Matthew, we'll go back to you. Yeah, I mean, I think there actually are a lot of really good immigration reporters out there, and I want to give credit to those folks who really do their homework. Um, it's often more the pundits on cable news who I would didn't, you know, I don't think are necessarily worth the time listening to. Um, but even in Christian media, I mean, uh, Christianity Today or World Magazine, I think have done a really great job of reporting on immigration issues and providing a, a nuanced view that then also reflects the biblical worldview. Um, you know, there's good organizations. Um, the one that we work closely with at World Relief and I really respect is the National Immigration Forum. Again, not coming at this from a partisan perspective, but just an analysis of what different policy uh, issues are, as well as some of the cultural dynamics around immigration. Um, yeah, so those would be a few places to start. The, the Evangelical Immigration Table that World Relief is a part of also has a number of resources. There's a blog there. Um, and, you know, both discipleship resources, but also policy statements as well. We had one a few hours ago about the refugee ceiling. Sharon? Sure. And I, I think what I'd like to do especially is to lift up, I mean, as Elkett had said a moment ago, no, no challenges in the realm of, of immigration are separated from other challenges, such as, as he mentioned, from uh, climate concerns. Also, that is true as the United States has been going through such a racial reckoning in the last year. It is true as well that uh, part of the education opportunities that we can look to now um, as Christians is to understand more of how um, our immigration policies are also themselves embedded with white privilege and thus with uh, particular injustices against black and brown bodies. And maybe more than any, we have been hearing again and again and seeing injustices as they are connected to black immigrants lately. And there are a number of um, black led immigration organizations that have emerged in recent years who help us understand uh, how some of those dynamics are particularly harmful to blacks. I would just lift up, for example, due to the Title 42 policy that has been expelling uh, immigrants, even back to places from which they had fled, right, to seek asylum. There have been 32 different flights since February of deportations, specifically of Haitians. 
There have also been lots of uh, deportations and expulsions of Cameroonians and others. So I think it's really important in this time to listen to groups like African Communities Together, the Haitian Bridge Alliance, Baji, uh, Black Alliance for Just Immigration, and other Black immigrant-led organizations that help us, uh, As even as Alcott was talking about the need for those of us who are white to read scripture with broader lenses is they help us look at our immigration policies and how they impact communities of color better. Okay. Yes, I, I do believe that if you, if you want to know uh, about immigration from a non-political perspective or a Christian perspective, um, you should at least, we in CBF Advocacy, we put out a biblical resource on immigration. You're going to find there, um, and you can go to our webpage, the www.cbf.net Immigration and Refugee Advocacy. Uh, you will find some biblical resources. And these are, uh, I'll say, non denominational resources. We went around and picked the best, what we think were the best manuals, the best uh, Bible studies, documentaries, even poems on immigration so that it can frame your mind you'll, you'll frame your mind with what the bible has to say on immigration um i would say that if you want to know about um what's happening at the border uh the best way to the best place to go and and, and no pun intended is to fellowship southwest uh, fellowshipsouthwest.org. I mean, I write there, but in reality, sometimes things that are on the news two weeks later, we already wrote about them two weeks before. Because in reality, we have this network of five border Christian and Baptist border pastors who work with migrants in northern Mexico and even as even in Tapachula, Chiapas, Mexico. So we already have an idea of what's going to happen in northern Mexico before it happens. We're aware of the caravans. We try to keep uh, a good temperature as to the migrant flow and the needs of these pastors as they do missions uh, in our southern border and as well on Mexico's no northern border. So if you want to keep up, be updated on that, and if you want to help us doing mission and advocacy on this realm, you can go to fellowshipsouthwest.org. Well, as I said before, there's so many questions I, I still want to ask, and maybe we need to create a, another time to have you all back on for for a conversation. But I do want to go back for my last question, something that Matthew said earlier, um, which is, you know, there's plenty of resources we can push people to of, of how to get involved in advocacy, how to contact your state and, and national level leaders. Uh, but I want to go back to something you said before, Matthew, about spiritual formation. Um, so I wonder if each of you can kind of uh, as, as concisely as you possibly can on a very loaded question, um, which is uh, what are some healthy ways you've seen churches navigate these issues through spiritual formation? Um, uh, we'll begin with you, Elkett. Um, I've seen churches um, coming to the realization that they need to get uh, engaged in this issue and trying to be as short as possible. Uh, it's not been comfortable sometimes. And we have to know, and I think this is the message that sometimes it's very difficult for me to convey to my some of my brothers, is that, brothers and sisters, <laughs> uh, is that um, sometimes this is not gonna be a comfortable uh, ministry. This is not gonna be a call to be comfortable. Um, and so I've seen churches trying to ease to, to what it's going to be uncomfortable. And it's been great because they, they're they starting to see how God is taking their churches to a lot of missions. I mean, they're starting to see that they that they have, uh, they had church members who were migrants and immigrants themselves. And they go to that person and that's how that person can help them understand what's happening. And there's other churches who are starting to realize that they need to get involved because a lot of their members are immigrants, migrants, or refugees. And so we, we have to allow God to work in us uh, through that uncomfortable reality sometimes and, and start doing what God has told us, even though it's going to be uncomfortable. But I've seen a lot of churches being transformed. And two years, three years after starting uh, working with migrants, being so, I will say, energized 
in doing mission work and in their mission that it's uh, I've seen churches transformed by this. So that's that's what I would say. Matthew. Yeah, again, I'd agree with Elka completely. And I, I think for the church, it's really important that this conversation starts as a discipleship, spiritual formation conversation and goes back to the Bible. As we've all, you know, we've all shared a few passages that are meaningful to us, and there's many more we could go into. Um, you know, one very simple tool that we've used at the Evangelical Migration Table is a simple Bible reading guide. It's We call it the I Was a Stranger Challenge, going back to that passage in Matthew 25. It is simply 40 Bible verses. There's no you know, interpretation of those passages. We're not telling people, and this means you should vote for this candidate or that candidate. Uh, it is simply 40 scriptures to read. And we found that's actually been very transformational, which shouldn't surprise us. We're told that, that God's word is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. But for a lot of Christians who somehow have managed to to be in the church for a long time and not realize that this was a biblical issue, it's a really important place to start. And then we can facilitate relationships and address some of the misconceptions that are there. But I think grounding the conversation in the Bible is so critical. Sharon, final word. Sure. I would say a few things. First of all, think about uh, where you are and who's near you. I think about a congregation in California who uh, realized that they had a number of Southeast Asian refugees around them in their community. They started a process of prayer and discernment that led to, first of all, to the formation of a Southeast Asian youth group within their congregation that was deeply enriching. It led also eventually to the formation of a Laotian congregation. It led to international mission partnerships annually in Laos. I think also um, think about who you are and what your own gifts and abilities are. One of our congregations in Kentucky, uh, outside of Louisville, just as an example, has a gentleman who really gets a kick out of repairing bicycles. He's helped that congregation donate more than and repair more than 3,000 bicycles that have been shared with refugees in his own community. And I also would lift up a model, you know, we talked earlier about sometimes we can't understand fully with with our own one set of eyes that are given. But by hearing through the voices of immigrants, we can understand more of scripture, something that we've uh, engaged in and, and I've learned so much myself through has been opportunities that we call IWOBs, uh, Immigrant Weekly Online Bible Studies, where we've had immigrant leaders and our congregations have opened up texts that I thought I understood and never could have understood in the same way. And the other thing I would say is think about the timing of the year uh, that we're in. We talked about bills that are that are happening. It's it's recess week um, now, and those happen periodically. Act when you can. And World Refugee Day is coming up. And this year, as isn't always the case, it's we know it's always on June 20th. This year, it's on a Sunday. It gives us even more opportunity as communities who happen to worship on Sundays to lift up voices of refugees, to lift up some of these many, many scriptures that we've talked about, and to pray in partnership with and celebrate relationships. What they've meant at a time when we know congregations are really deeply needed with higher refugee numbers now that are being allowed, we're needed down to do our welcoming part. One or two, uh, those listening, uh, we'll do our best to get some of the uh, resource links out to, to those listening um, after uh, this is no longer live. Uh, so check out the link later on for that. Um, we have to find, tell you about our final sponsor, which is BSK. Uh, what will ministry at your church look like as we exit the pandemic? Where do you see opportunities and insights needed? What are the pressure points that need support? BSK, the Baptist Seminary of Kentucky, invites you to take a short survey where you can share your insight. You'll be entered to win a $100 gift certificate to a, an online Black-owned bookstore. Help us out and take the survey today at bsk.edu backslash pathways. That's bsk.edu backslash pathways. I want to extend a word of thanks for those that are watching and those later on that will be uh, taking this in for adding your great questions. We apologize for not being able to get to them. Um, you can check out all of these people's work at their various organizational websites. Uh, Sharon, Matthew, and Elkett, um, we thank you for taking the time to be on here. Um, but more importantly, we want to thank you for 
your leadership and uh, helping us live out the mandate from Christ to love our neighbor as ourself. Well, that's it. Uh, that's our conversation. If you want more, subscribe to the CBF podcast on all major platforms, including iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, and Google Podcasts. Don't forget to like and share this episode with your favorite uh, social media platform. Be sure to support our annual sponsors by visiting their websites. Again, that's the Baptist Seminary of Kentucky, the Center for Congregational Health, and McAfee School of Theology's Doctor of Ministry program. Check out cbf.net for more information about church starters, field personnel, advocacy work, and much more.